Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson. And today, I am happy to welcome Patrick Killalee as our guest. Now, I've met Patrick, and he is the founder of the housing news and forum site, Patrick.net, which was one of the most active websites warning about the collapse of the U.S. national housing bubble years before it inevitably popped in 2007. He's also the author of the newly published book, The Housing Trap, How Buyers Are Captured and Abused and How to Defend Yourself. Now, I've invited Patrick on here to talk about housing because for many, falling house prices were the canary in the coal mine that ushered in the era of economic malaise we find ourselves mired in, but now we're hearing murmurs of a housing recovery. And a lot of people have a lot of questions about, is this the right time to buy a house? And if so, what should I look for? Are there any of the old abuses still with us? These are all things I want to talk about today. And uh, well, welcome, Patrick. It's great to finally land you as a guest here. Well, thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Great. So tell us about the current state of the housing market. Are we indeed looking at a recovery in home prices? Is it is it safe to get back in the water like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times are, are trying to convince me almost daily? Well, prices at the low end are definitely rising. All measures are showing that. But, you know, I don't like to use the word recovery because it implies uh, there's something good about rising prices. You know, rising prices are a kind of inflation. And, you know, I would be delighted if reporters would, you know, use the correct term and say housing inflation returns. But, you know, back to the point, yeah, prices are rising at the, at the low end. And uh, I think it's not really an organic growth. What's happening is that a lot of investors realize uh, two important things. Uh, one, that the, the price of a house in the biggest bubble areas, uh, like Phoenix, uh, they fell well below the price uh, implied by the rental valuation. So, you know, these guys, they want to make a profit, and they realize, hey, you know, if we buy up these houses and rent them out, we're going to get a better return on our money than we can get anywhere else especially, you know, with interest rates being as low as they are. Um, and, you know, the the return uh, on a rental property, often referred to as a capitalization rate, um, can easily be like 10% in these areas. And that's huge. Uh, so that drew the attention of not only little investors, but actually even um, big hedge funds. Um, although recently, a lot of those have announced they're getting out of the game. They seem to have picked over a lot of these places, and there aren't, there aren't the deals that there were even a year or two ago. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, really expensive places like uh, New York City, the crash, you know, was very muted. I mean, there was hardly a crash at all. There was a, a downward trend in prices. Um, but what that means is it's still difficult or maybe even impossible to buy property in New York City and rent it out for a profit. Uh, you can't do it. Uh, you'll lose money. Um, so if you're buying there, you'd be betting purely on appreciation that's not justified by the underlying, you know, fundamentals. And, uh, even places like Zillow, uh, which projected, you know, prices in various cities, uh, in 2013, the coming year, uh, they project Phoenix will continue to rise, but they project New York City will continue to fall. Um, so I'd say that overall it's been split. Oh, and I said investors realize two things. Uh, so first they realized that, you know, prices had fallen below the point where it makes sense to buy, so it does make sense to buy in those places. But the other thing investors realized is that um, they have cash, and uh, ordinary buyers, families, uh, don't generally have enough cash to uh, buy outright. So that gives the investors a huge advantage, especially since lending is still pretty tight, even with the low interest rates. Um, it's still uh, considerably harder to get a mortgage now than it was, you know, in the in the big bubble years, 2004 and five. Um, so I'd say it's an investor-driven recovery, and and that recovery is really only in the places where they had a huge bubble and a huge crash. So I'd say it's safe to buy in those areas, um, especially in places where uh, the house is lower than the rental equivalent cost. 
Well, so we always have um, supply and demand are always part of this story, and and there's been demand on the low end, you say, coming from investors. So these are people looking to do this purely for economic reasons, less so maybe than organic. I need a place to live. I'm going to buy this this house. We know that Phoenix did undergo, as as one example, a pretty tremendous amount of overbuilding at one point because you know they they had a nice bubble and you couldn't build them fast enough, and people were speculating and. Then they had a lot of supply. So on the supply side, to start there, how much, I mean, we I read a lot about shadow inventory for years, and it's kind of gone back burner, but uh, I'm wondering if you have any insights as to uh, how much the supply side of this story has been constrained by the fact that banks may be keeping properties on their books. That's very hard to tell, because there really aren't any good statistics on shadow inventory. I mean, sort of by definition, it's in the in the shadows. Um so there are and have been for a long time rumors that the banks are holding vast amounts of property off the market or not even on their books. What they're doing is um, refusing to foreclose on some properties so that they don't have to take the ownership and they don't get the hit you know, to their books. Uh, so maybe the mortgage is not being paid, but the, the money is still technically owed. So I think there are uh, certainly a, a large number of houses in this sort of limbo situation but it's really hard to to tell exactly how many. Or at least I haven't been able to figure it out. I haven't either. I was hoping you'd had better insights because I keep hearing what is a little more than I, I don't know. There, it's slightly rumorish. You know, there there are rumors and there are hints that these things might be happening. When we look at, um, for instance, when you look at mortgage default rates and you compare the overall staggering number of those against the actual number of houses that have gone up for. Uh, short sales or other sort of distress sales, there still seems to be a fairly sizable gap there, uh, which yeah. has to be, I don't know, shadow inventory, I guess. Exactly. You would think, in theory, it's at least possible to pin it down because uh, a mortgage default does get recorded at the county offices as a notice of default. And even if the bank doesn't take possession and sell it, yeah, you could compare the, the total number of defaults to the total you know, bank sales, and you could get some idea. But I haven't seen anyone do that, at least not publicly. Right, right. I, well, I, I only squint at it and make my best guess. It, it leads me to suspect there is more supply out there, but it only makes sense. If I'm a bank, I would do this too. If I had supply that, if I had to recognize the loss right away or maybe sit on it in the hopes that I could turn this whole thing around and, and maybe get out without a loss later on, uh, obviously it makes sense to sort of wait and, and see what's going to happen. And of course, waiting has helped because uh, here we are four years into this crisis. We have the lowest mortgage rates ever. Demand side of this equation, which we got to get to now, is, of course, going to uh, stabilize and pick up at some point. Population continues to expand as long as the job situation is stabilized. We would, and of course, local mileage varies in this story. Are we talking about Spokane? Are we talking about um, uh, St. Petersburg? It really depends on on that side of things. But uh so on the demand side, we've seen, obviously, people uh, started to step in on the low end of the housing spectrum first. That's where some of the best bargains were. Uh, the speculators were there back again. In some cases, that's where people who couldn't afford these new, more stringent standards had to start. And as well, we had investors. So I, we've cataloged some of the demand that existed there on the low end of the housing um, stock. What about on the high end? On the high end, I don't think demand has changed much at all. Um Prices don't seem to be plummeting at the high end, but they're not skyrocketing either. It just it seems stable. Stable and and uh, are you looking? This is national statistics, I assume. Right, just what I can you know get from say Zillow or maybe the Case Shiller to the degree they break it down. Right, right, and and if uh, if someday interest rates begin to rise, how how do you think this is going to impact everything? Obviously, it should have a negative effect because. You know, just like a bond, when, when rates go up, the value of assets that depend on debt go down. But um, historically, uh, rising rates haven't always forced down the price of housing. Sometimes there's rising rates because uh, there's inflation. So I think uh, maybe in the, the 70s, um, you had uh, rising interest rates and rising inflation, and house prices uh did not go down because uh, salaries were increasing enough to keep up with the uh, the uh, higher interest payments. Interesting. So you mentioned so, before the, the most important part of this for me, which was um, that it's we should call it house price inflation. Uh, the, the, I guess once upon a time we all right. thought that houses were real assets, like, I don't know, owning a company. 
Uh, but they're not. They're a depreciating asset if they're any kind at all. And of course, getting house price rises is uh, part of that story. And, and it's a good one, I guess, if your house is rising in price. But let's talk about inarguably one of the larger sources potentially of why things might increase in price through an inflationary dynamic, and that's money printing. In your views, all the QE1, QE2, QE eternity, uh, all of this money printing that's going on, what sort of an impact will that have on the housing market? Well, you would think that it would, you know, cause general inflation and therefore housing inflation, but it has to get into people's hands, uh-huh. and that means it has to, there has to be a salary increase first. People have to get, you know, uh, wages with which to buy houses if house prices are going to go up. And uh, that just isn't happening. I mean, I think there's, there's very little wage inflation. In fact, wages declined for a few years there, right? So, um, it's, you know, all this money printing, I think, is really going to bail out banks. What's happening is the Fed uh, prints or creates money and gives it to banks in exchange for, like, say, mortgage-backed bonds. And so it doesn't really affect the, the common man, you know, the guy in the street. It doesn't really change much uh, for him. So, so I don't see it as uh, affecting uh, house prices directly. What it does maybe is um, prevent the, the banks from having to take big losses on their mortgage-backed bonds. Well, it, it does that. I think there is one other mechanism, which is that if a bank gets 0% money from the Fed, turns around, loans it to a private equity firm at 5%, and they can go and scoop up thousands of properties in Phoenix at a 10% cap rate, uh, you could find yourself as a common person looking for an affordable house in competition with uh, that free money, at least through that dynamic, to the extent that's part of a market. Yeah, that's true. That could happen. But uh, I get the impression a lot of these you know, big hedge funds, they don't actually need to borrow this money. They've got too much money as it is. <laughs> yeah, well, They've got well, too much yeah, all that cash came from somewhere. I, I, I just, I, I look at that that money printing. It's a leaky sieve. You, you know, the Fed releases that money into the wild, and it goes somewhere, and sometimes it ends up in hedge funds um, by who knows how. So, that it's possibility. Okay, so uh, I'm a private individual. Then uh, let's imagine what factors should I most be concerned with today if I was looking at whether or not to buy a particular property. Well, I'd say the price. Is, you know, it sounds silly, but so many people don't look at the price. They look at maybe how much a month they're paying and what, you know, can they at the moment afford that. And I don't think that's a good way to, to make a decision to buy. Uh, I think what people should really do is think of themselves as a landlord and buy only when a landlord would buy. And even if they're going to live at it themselves, you know, in a sense, they're renting it to themselves. So if you pay more than a landlord would pay, you know, that might suit your personal lifestyle or desire to impress friends and family, but it's not a good financial decision. Um, the goal is really to keep yourself free of debt, you know, and debt is a trap, which limits your options. It limits, you know, you can't move to take a better job, and um, you're, kind of, you're forced to keep working. Uh, so I'd say, you know, the real goal for everyone should be to keep yourself as free as possible, to keep yourself, you know, away from debt, or at least unreasonable debt. I think some debt is reasonable if it means, you know, that you end up paying less for the, the house overall and you would pay in the equivalent uh, rent if you were renting the same thing. So if you can use debt to lower your total expenses, well, that's a good thing. But if you're just getting into debt because you just want, you know, to buy this thing, uh, that's, that's not a good financial decision. But maybe you're asking about more specific house advice, like some things that come up on my forum are, uh, like, look for good construction, because the the foreclosed houses, you know, and the ones that get into trouble tend to be uh, bad construction. They cost their owners a lot more money. They cost it in unexpected ways. So to, to really know that you're, you're getting good construction, I mean, you can try to go by the reputation of the builder, but it's always best to hire a good inspector on your own, do not get a recommendation from a realtor because realtors are trying to draw you in, try to get you to sign a contract with them, and then they're going to try to maximize your debt, minimize your freedom, which is the opposite of what you really want. So let's see, you know, you want good construction. And in, in general, you want neighborhoods where employment is stable or likely to increase rather than decrease because employment is what drives salaries mm-hmm. and salaries drive rent and give people the ability to borrow. 
So ultimately, salaries are what you know drives the underlying value of a house. So places with uh, stable employment, uh, especially a wide variety of employment, and not dependent on a single industry. So one reason, like Detroit, was a real disaster for owners there, people who bought houses, is that the whole region was dependent on one industry, the auto industry, and there weren't really alternatives. But if you look at Chicago, which isn't far away, and it was very similar, you know, not too long ago, it has the same weather, the same people, and the same history, but Chicago has this widely diversified industrial base. A lot of industries, no one of them can bring down the whole city. So I think, you know, Chicago was safer, and it proved in the long run that, you know, people who bought there uh, didn't lose nearly uh, what people in Detroit did, although they, they still had their own bubble, though it wasn't very extreme. Yeah, no, I, I perhaps not. I know people who try and live in the Washington, D.C. area say it's still a very tight housing market there. Of course, that's the center of the empire, so there's uh, seems to be endless endless uh, uh, government demand for housing there, and so that drives a lot uh, as well. I guess out, uh, you know, sort of towards your neck of the woods, uh, Silicon Valley. I've heard a lot of stories that there's still an extraordinary demand there. And uh, I'm wondering if you, you know, just want to opine on, on, say, one of these really hot markets where, let's take Northern California, Bay Area, where a lot of houses, my sister happens to be there right now, so matter of personal interest, she's been out there about six months renting. She's kind of one of those people who I think wants to buy, and, and maybe for some of the reasons you mentioned, I'm not sure. And, uh, uh, she's, she's encountering this, that, that a basic, like what she considers to be a basic home for her and her family w- would be about a million bucks. That, that's sort of like a starting point. Um, exactly. That's absurd. Yeah. Well, so, so square that up because a lot of people look at that and go, well, it's been this way for a long time. It's that way in Vancouver. It's, there's hot spots around we can still point to and say it's still like that. Talk to us about the relationship that has to exist or should exist or, or in your mind, does one exist that between median income and, and median house prices? Well, um, people tend to overestimate how long the situation has been like that. So um, there's a great book called Sell Now by John Talbot, who uh, he documents how the price-to-rent ratio in the San Francisco area was actually normal. It was like the rest of the country until the dot-com bubble, until about the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Even though prices here were always high, rents were always high, too. But then what happened is prices pulled away, and rents remain high, but prices went crazy. And I think we still clearly have a bubble in the Bay Area. I think, you know, it's not uncommon for, you know, houses to be rented out at 2 to 3% of what it would cost, you know, what, what the price would be for that house. Right. That just doesn't cut it, because... Once you've paid, you know, maintenance and property tax, you know, that's down to zero. No landlord would do that. And, in fact, that's one reason that there aren't a lot of rentals around here, because landlords can't make a profit at them. Hmm. Uh, that's why there aren't a lot of rental houses. Yep. Uh, there are a lot of rental apartments, and that's typically what people end up doing when they, you know, run into this for the first time. You rent some apartment, because... You, you, you do the math and you try to figure out, well, why is it exactly that I should pay that much? And there is no rational justification for it. And it's not uh, a very long-term thing. It, has, it started in the dot-com bubble, and I think it's going to go back one way or another. I mean, I suppose it's possible that the already high rents could rise further, but it doesn't seem likely because, you know, rents are very tightly controlled by salaries, which you can see just by, you know, the little thought experiment, you know, Let's say, you know, let's go into a bank and borrow money to pay rent. You know, you walk in and you ask, can I get a loan to pay my rent? Hmm. The answer is going to be no, 100% of the time. I mean, nobody's going to give you money to pay rent. So rents are really directly controlled by salaries, whereas housing prices are actually often, you know, largely determined by lending. Hmm. Uh, and in, in, in the bubble, they were determined almost completely by lending. So... And then it got into a runaway, you know, feedback loop where banks would loan, people would use that money and buy, even though they couldn't really afford it based on their salary. Prices would go up. The banks would count the increased prices as additional equity and then loan more on the basis of, you know, the increased prices that they just caused. Uh, so that whole situation, you know, it unwound here in in the low-end neighborhoods, there are places in the Bay Area where it makes sense to buy, but they're not good places. They're generally, you know, they're poor neighborhoods right. where 
yeah, a lot of people, that's where the le- the loan, you know, to income ratio was really far out of whack. Yeah. And they're, you know, far east bay, parts of Oakland. And, you know, those people, well, you know, they really couldn't pay those mortgages, and they really didn't. And, you know, when lending stopped, those prices plummeted. And, in fact, lend- investors are buying up places. And, like, you know, you could, there are places, South San Jose, and there's even people on my forum who've told me personally that they've gone down there and they've found condos anyway and, you know, bought them and they're renting them out and they're making, like, their 10% and they're delighted. So there are a lot of uh, rich neighborhoods where there's no way to, to buy and, and rent out at a profit. Uh, and those prices, you know, have come down slightly, but they're still completely unreasonable. So I expect them to come down more. In the same way, Zillow is projecting a decline in the New York City market, maybe only a two or three percent in the coming year. I think uh, the Bay Area is still likely to fall further to get back to the normal ratio it had before. And your your prime measure of that is the ratio between rental rates and uh, purchase price, uh, you know, calculated out on a percentage basis. So, so you're yeah. seeing that there are you can still, in some cases, rent houses at two to three percent of the cost to own. And that's just uh, one sign of the bubble. Is there a? Uh, do you ever look at uh, median incomes to median house price, or is that just not helpful? Well, um, I try, but the Bay Area is also a little weird in that you know, in the dot com bubble when this started happening, a lot of equity flowed from the rest of the country to here. You know, because a lot of people owned stock in tech companies, and their stock, you know, it went way up in the bubble, and enough of them cashed out that there's some, you know, unknown amount. It's hard to tell, like, what are the assets of everyone in this area. But I, you know, suspect some of this is still driven by, you know, a a residual effect of the dot-com bubble where there was this huge amount of money sloshing in here with, you know, because all these, you know, poor people in the rest of the country invested in, I don't know, pets.com, right? And, you know, the people who worked at pets.com out here cashed out. And so some of that money is still here. And it's hard to tell exactly how much because, you know, the IRS doesn't report, like, asset statistics, as far as I know. I have lots of good income statistics for the area, but not asset statistics. Well, that's a great metaphor. It reminds me of Spain in the 1500s. So they went out and started uh, conquistadoring the world and brought all this New World gold back, and they thought they were rich. And all that they did was ignite uh, an amazing round of inflation. And what happened was they brought new capital back into the system. And uh, so Spain had this extraordinary bout of inflation. It turned out they weren't any wealthier. They just had to pay more for everything, which is uh, the essence of it. So I hadn't thought of that as kind of like a... Uh, the old day, uh, a modern sort of gold accumulation. So once all that equity sort of lands in a region, it works its way through its region. Maybe one of the impacts of that is the house prices you still see out there. Exactly. The housing inflation. There was huge housing inflation here. And it was really a disaster for a lot of people. You know, if, if you owned and you wanted to sell, then you win. Mm-hmm. If you want to sell and downsize and move somewhere else. But if you own and you don't want to sell, well, you don't really win because you know, you're in the same house as before. In theory, it's worth more, but you haven't sold. And, you know, people who want to move here lost because prices are un- still unreasonably high for normal working people. So it, it really wasn't a good thing overall, in my opinion. Right, and, and there's that other pernicious effect, which is that uh, because of the property tax laws out there, you could be living in the exact same house as your neighbor, but they've owned theirs for 30 years. You just bought yours. Uh, and your right. property taxes are going to be many, many multiples of theirs uh, because of this system. It creates a little, a little sense of injustice. Like, hold on, not everybody's contributing the same, right? It's very unjust. Prop thirteen, which is what you're talking about, yeah, yeah, it was uh, proposed as a way to protect poor old people from, you know, being forced out when their property taxes went up, when house values went up. But what wasn't really mentioned at the time, but and I'm pretty sure it was the real goal, was you know, to protect uh, businesses and, and wealthy people from paying property tax. So there, there was no means test. So there are a lot of extremely rich people, and I knew one of them, like my boss's boss at Charles Schwab, owns a house in Palo Alto, it's worth $3 million, and he leaves it empty. And he lives in San Francisco, and he's a rich guy. And I said, you know, one day, well, you know, how can you just do that? Don't you know? Don't you worry about the property taxes? And he laughed and he said, "You know, you pay my property taxes for me." 
And I thought, wow, that just encapsulates it perfectly. I mean, that's what Prop 13 is about. Hmm. And, and businesses, you know, businesses, why should businesses, which never die, right, why should they uh, be exempt from property tax increases? If the general economy is rising and the land values are rising, they sh- their taxes should also rise. But, you know, these things were sort of hidden in the back of Prop 13, and it was sold very successfully as a way to protect these poor old people. But, you know, no means test, and also applies to businesses. Oh, and now, it got even worse recently. They they altered it so that um, old people can pass on their, their low property tax rate to their descendants. So, you know, it Ooh. sounds like they're trying to uh, create a hereditary aristocracy. There'll be, you know, a few families which own land forever, and, uh, and others just won't be able to buy it. Right, because they'll have to... The, the, somebody's got to pay all those... Uh... Uh, tasty pensions and all the other things that are, you know, the public works that need that do need uh, funding, and and so it creates a, a what an interesting thing that it's created uh, certainly some very odd incentives, and uh, if uh, you can hereditarily pass it, that'll sort of perpetuate maybe ripple that through a little deeper. Um, okay, so let's imagine I'm out there, or I'm, or I'm anywhere, and I just purely economic reasons, I'm trying to make a should I rent right now? Should I buy? Is there a methodology that you use? How, how would I solve that for myself? Well, you know, I always just say, ignore the overall market. Just look at this one house, you know, and do that rent versus buy thing, you know. If you don't overpay, meaning if you don't pay more than a landlord would, then you're pretty safe, you know. The, the idea here is to stay safe, not to trap yourself in debt. That's the, the main methodology I would use would say, would, would you be able to rent it out and cover all the costs? Another way you can look at it is, okay, let's say you get fired and you can't pay the mortgage anymore. Now what? Well, if you've got a house where you could rent it out and cover all the costs, you have no real risk there. Okay, maybe you have to move and rent it out, but you're not going to lose the equity you put into it or the work you put into it. You don't have to sell because the rent can cover the mortgage and the property tax and the maintenance. Mm Mm-hmm. So that, that's the main thing. Um, I would also say, you know, as part of methodology, you know, do not rely on agents. Uh, if you just, you know, think about buyers' agents for a minute, you know, they claim to be free, but, you know, the idea that you can get good advice for free, you know, has, uh, I don't think that has a lot of credibility. Uh-huh. I mean, agents don't get paid unless you buy at least commission-based agents. They don't get paid unless you buy. And even worse than that, they get paid more if you overpay. Now, they may not care about the extra bit that they get paid more if you overpay, but they care a lot about getting paid at all. So they're going to tell you, or at least their financial motive is to tell you to, to overbid by as much as possible. And, you know, they, they push these emotional buttons. They're, they're, very, they're really experts at it. You know, it, you know, status and family and home and, you know, to, and their goal really is just to get their commission as quickly as possible. And to do that, they want you to overbid by as much as possible. They want you to get deeply into debt so they can get that commission and get out of there. So I'd say, you know, avoid agents, especially avoid buyer's agents. Um, you can hire an agent by the hour and then they don't have that conflict of interest. Or you can hire a real estate lawyer by the hour to look over the paperwork. You could fill out the papers yourself to make an offer. And if you're worried, you know, an hour of a lawyer's time isn't that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's actually these books by, uh, say, Nolo Press. I don't know if you know them, but they're very no. good. Uh, they tell you how to, uh, you know, do things a lawyer would do and how to do it yourself. And they often have all the forms in the book. Which are, what, so, what are they called again? Uh, NOLO, N-O-L-O. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they have a whole series of books on how to, basically, how to do what lawyers do, you know, yourself, in, in simple cases. Okay. So let's imagine, um, I, I've, I'm, I'm looking at a house, purely economic purposes here, uh, and I add up, you're saying as long as the rent could cover all the costs, so the costs of ownership being principal, interest, taxes, insurance, plus some maintenance, whatever that's going to turn out to be. Uh, and, and as long as the rent is basically covering that, you feel that's relatively safe at this point in time? Yeah, I, I do. And, uh, you know, I don't worry too much, like I said, about the overall market. It's really hard to predict macroeconomics, or at least I don't, think, I don't feel confident I can do it. 
But you can look at one house and you can say, oh, clearly, you know, the rent here will cover, you know, the interest on this price and, you know, these other expenses. You can do that. Or at least I can do that. And I think most people can. All right, so let's imagine I'm on the opposite side of that equation. I'm in a house that I am positive uh, I can't. I, maybe I've owned it. Maybe I own it outright, or maybe I still got a mortgage on it. But for whatever reason, I own a house, and I'm positive that I can't rent it out for what the monthly cost would be to carry this. Even if I own it outright, if you follow me, my you know I have very low expenses on this. But I'm looking at it, and I'm going, this this feels uh, over overpriced in essence at this point. What would your advice be to that person on purely economic terms? You mean they're thinking of buying it? No, they own it. They or own it. They already, is, oh, they already own it. You own a house where well, you're positive you can't rent it for what it would cost to buy. Well, if you don't have to sell, then you know you don't have to do anything. Right. You know, it really depends on like how much equity they have in it, and do they have more? You know, if there's more debt, if they're underwater, right? If they can't sell it and get back enough to pay the debt mm-hmm. that they have, well, then you know, in some states, um, it's actually only a minority of states, but in some states you can walk away and and the bank can do nothing but take the house. It, that's called a, a non-recourse a mortgage. And there's non-recourse states. California is one of them where, you know, the bank can't come after your personal assets because the mortgage agreement said, we are loaning you money against this house and this house alone. Um, but there's, there's a lot of tricks in that. Um, so, for example, even in California, if you refinance, quite often in the, in the small print, it says, oh, and by the way, now you're guaranteeing this mortgage with all your personal assets. Then you have a real problem. Now you're underwater and you can't walk away. Uh, they can come after your assets and completely bankrupt you. It's not just a house anymore. So, you know, that's the kind of thing where you need a lawyer. You need somebody to tell you exactly how much you're on the hook for. Well, I'd say if you don't have to sell in that situation, don't. I mean, why should you? I mean, just because you're underwater... Um, that doesn't actually change anything as long as you keep, you know, you keep making those payments. Although, I, I have to say, there was a common trick being played in California, uh, in, in housing divisions when the bubble started crashing, where, uh, some people who were underwater, and they would notice, wow, the house across the street is, you know, it's got the identical, maybe mirror image floor, floor plan. I could buy it for half as much as my current debt. So, they would go out and they would buy the second house and then default on the first one. Hmm. And they would greatly reduce their debt that way. So, you know, that was one way, you know, people underwater could lower their debt. Maybe it's not ethical, uh, but, you know, they were doing it. That sounds like business to me. Yeah, uh, it's just business. And, yeah, I mean, really mortgages are, it's just business. Uh, there's, the banks aren't human, it's, and they don't have feelings. They don't care about you, and I'm not sure you should care about them. All right. Well, your recent book is titled The Housing Trap, uh, implying there, there's some risks and pitfalls in there that home buyers, maybe sellers, need to be aware of. Uh, you mentioned perhaps um, conflicts of interest that might exist within the profession. Uh, you've noted already that um, we want to make sure that we're not overpaying for a house relative to what it could be rented for. So, so there's sort of a bifurcation there to make sure the numbers uh, line up. Uh, what else is in, in there that uh, home buyers should be aware of in this day and age and... Uh, if there's anything there, how do they avoid them? Well, there's, there's all kind of tricks that agents play. I, I list them, or at least a lot of them, in my book. Although, you know, there's probably more. It'll probably take several more books to cover it all. Um, <laughs> right. Like, and especially there's a lot of psychological manipulation of buyers. And agents, they're really, I mean, they're used house salesmen. That sounds kind of harsh, but it's true. They're kind of like used car salesmen. They, you know, they're not there to provide value. They're there to get a commission. That's their goal. And if, if you don't buy, they don't get paid. So, like, a typical trick of theirs would be, you know, first taking you around and showing you extremely ugly and overpriced houses. And then they show you the one they think, you know, you'll buy. Maybe it's overpriced as well, but not as bad. And so then, you know, you've got this sort of anchoring effect, and it makes you a little uh, more susceptible. Um but all kinds of other, I mean, and really evil games are played. And because um, the whole, you know, housing market is very non-transparent, uh, you really, it's very hard to, to pin them down. So you don't have any way of knowing if there are any other offers at all because you're not allowed to look at the other offers. Um, you don't know that they exist. 
And so agents can lie with impunity and say, you know, oh, there's 20 offers, and, and people just believe it because they think, well, why would the agent lie? <laughs> but, you know, clearly they're not thinking hard enough. Mm-hmm. You know, the agent has a motive to lie. And if you can't, you know, prove they're not lying, then, well, the agent has the means, the motive, and the opportunity, you know, to, to deceive you for profit. And that would be enough to convict them, you know, if they were being, uh, if, you know, in in court. But it's normal business practice in real estate, so nobody seems to think twice about it. So those are some of the things I go over in my book. So caveat emptor, I, I read recently, and maybe this is an extreme case, but there was some poor young family that found themselves getting sick in their home and with a little bit of investigation discovered it used to be a meth lab. And it's right. so saturated with chemicals that they literally were going to have to tear out everything that was porous, which is all the sheetrock, carpeting, you name it and redo it, and they just couldn't swing that. And, and in the process of discovery, they're like, well, this seems like a material disclosure. Who knew about this? Turned out the realtor knew about it, but, but didn't have to. They didn't ask. That, that, was the, that was the defense was like, well, you never asked. And you would think a material disclosure like that is part of it, but it turns out to this young family's dismay, it wasn't part of it. In fact, caveat emptor. Yes, and, you know, agents, and house inspectors often have a cozy relationship, a little too cozy, where, you know, the agent recommends an inspector, and the inspector sort of tacitly agrees he's not going to find anything. And then, you know, he gets business from the realtor, and the realtor gets, you know, the recommendation that you should buy it. So really, you should separate those things. That's another thing I point out in my book. You know, don't take your realtor's recommendation for an inspector. Find your own inspector, preferably one who has nothing to do with that realtor. Right, right. Okay, well, let's imagine, um, real quick, we're on the other side of this now. Uh, I'm a seller. What advice do you have for me? Um, well, I think the main thing is don't sell too often, hmm. uh, because it really is very expensive. Um, you know, even though I think you don't need a realtor to sell, in fact, you'll come out ahead if you don't have one, most people still do use them. But that means you're paying it, you know, probably six, maybe seven or eight percent to sell a house. And if you do that, you know, every, Six years or so, you're you're losing quite a lot of money. It's like one percent, which is a lot in one percent per year, right? So, um, you know, most people think when they buy a house, they're going to stay there twenty, thirty years. But the reality is, the median length of ownership in America is only six years. Hmm. So, don't count on staying somewhere too long when you buy. And also, like when you own, I guess you you ask those my advice for sellers. You know, uh, don't don't keep don't upgrade too frequently because it's, it's more expensive than you think it is. And I guess my other advice is, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can probably make more money and get a better deal on your own than with an agent. There's lots of FFBO sites now for sale by owner. Mm-hmm. And you can even just pay to get listed in the MLS and avoid the agent. Or, you know, maybe you need the, to hire an agent by the hour and then the agent will list your house in the MLS. But with the Internet, you know, it's pretty easy for buyers to find all those other houses. And they do. Well, it's interesting that in this country, we just, you know, so embedded that, of course, you have to have a real realtor, a real estate agent involved. Uh, in the UK, I discovered it's it's vastly different. First of all, the commission is 1%. And second of all, uh, often what the realtor is doing is, is just making the initial introduction, and then almost all of the negotiation happens to face-to-face, buyer-to-seller. Uh, it's just a whole different model. It, and it, as soon as I saw it, I was like, well, of course you could do it that way, too. It'd be like you buying a car from me. Uh, there would be some sort of a an arrangement that we would go through. Yeah, I, I, that sounds like a much better model to me. And I, I've heard that's true in, uh, in other European countries, too, that it, it's not necessarily... I mean, people don't expect to use a realtor, and they certainly think it's kind of strange that anyone would expect to get free, good advice. I mean, you're going to get... You can get good <laughs> advice, or you can get free advice, but it's probably not going to be free and good. Pick one. <laughs> All right. Well, we've been talking with Patrick Killalee, spelled K-I-L-L-E-L-E-A. You can find his book... The Housing Trap, I found it on Amazon right away when I looked. And uh, if you're thinking of buying or selling or maybe just know somebody who is or is interested in this, you really ought to get a copy uh, because you're looking for uh, – you'll have to pay for this advice, but it's not a lot, and uh, it's good advice. I, I advise you to take a peek at that book if you're interested. So, Patrick, thank you so much for your time today. Do you have any final words for us here on where the housing market is going? Um, well, it's uh, it's daily – uh, excitement. Uh, okay. I have a forum at my website, patrick.net, yep. and uh, people can follow it there. There's lots of activity. 
lots of people talking about and discussing right. where exactly. the markets are excellent. And uh, it's a great site. I, I learned a lot from it and uh, over time. And so thank you for all your work you've done there. And I wish you all the best. Okay. Thanks, Chris. All right.